July 26th, 1999. Warm summer night in Southern California. I was sitting under a lamp playing Pokemon Blue version on my Game Boy Color. My grandma came in asking if I wanted to go to Blockbuster. As I'm browsing through the Nintendo 64 section, I notice a game I've never seen before. Pokemon Snap. I was an avid Pokemon fan at the time. I was always watching the show. I played the game all the time. Shirts, hats, backpack, you name it. Okay, maybe I was a bit obsessed. It was a healthy obsession at least. The Pokemon series has helped me through a lot of troubled times in my life, but that's a story for another time. So there it was, this new Pokemon game. I didn't know what it was, but I knew I had to play that game. I get home with my rental copy, pop it in my N64, and just fall in love. It's the first time in North America that we got to explore the Pokemon world in 3D. Blockbuster Video even had this awesome machine called a Snap Station that would allow you to bring in your own copy of the game and insert the cartridge to print out stickers of the photos you've taken throughout your journey. We as the player were immersed in the mini biomes of this new Pokemon locale called Pokemon Island. Armed with the Zero One and the camera, we are tasked with exploring these areas and taking pictures of the Pokemon that reside within. The first level you're transported to is Beach. After a quick tutorial, you're on your way to take all the photos you'd like until you run out of film. Beach really sets the tone for the rest of the game. A simplistic on-rails shooter where your goal is to capture as many photos as you can of these wild Pokemon. It also shows you that the game is hiding secrets behind every corner. Even on the first level, it shows you that you'll inevitably have to go through each one multiple times. For example, the earliest secret that people will notice is Snorlax. You can't get a good picture of it until much later in the game via the Poke Flute. Every time you exit the map, you'll be sent to the camera check, where you'll choose what pictures you think are the best. After selecting all of your favorite images, you send them off to Professor Oak to give you a score. While showing Oak your photos, he'll tell you what he thinks about them and has some great voice lines to go with it. Oh! Wow! Wonderful! You were close! Perfect! As you progress through the stages, you'll notice that some events cause a reaction on the map. Be it an explosion, or move from a different Pokemon, or two Pokemon fighting over something you threw. Almost every action in each map can have some sort of reaction that you can take a picture of, or open up a secret that's hidden within. Some of these reactions are also the only way to be able to progress through the story of the game. It's a very smart mechanic that causes players to test everything they see while traversing the landscapes of the island. Now the track system for the Zero One is a pretty simple one. It's like most on-rails shooter games, it takes you from point A to point B with zero deviation from the path. Every time around will take you on the same path through the course, but unlike other on-rails games, the Zero One does allow you to make small movements while on the track. These movements aren't mandatory to make it through the game, but they do allow for better pictures when needed and allowed. While the movement of the Zero One isn't necessary, the other items in the game not only enhance the gameplay, but actually progress the game. Unlike some other games where upgrades or additional items aren't needed, to complete the game, you need to unlock and use every single item the game offers to make it to the final course. You gain the use of the apple-shaped Pokemon food, pester balls, poke flute, and the Zero One's turbo mechanic. These items aren't only used to allow the player to gain those extra points from photos, but they are needed to interact with the world map to get the poke signs on each course and to collect every Pokemon photo. Since we're talking about collecting every photo, let's go over the list of all 63 Pokemon obtainable in the game. Pidgey, Doduo, Pikachu, Butterfree, Lapras, Snorlax, Meowth, Scyther, Chansey, Eevee, Kangaskhan, Electro, Electabuzz, Kakuna, Zubat, Zapdos, Haunter, Magikarp, Diglett, Dugtrio, Magnemite, Magneton, Rapidash, Vulpix, Charmander, Magmar, Moltres, Growlithe, Arcanine, Charmeleon, Charizard, Poliwag, Bulbasaur, Slowpoke, Slowbro, Shelder, Vileplume, Metapod, Psyduck, Porygon, Cloyster, Grimer, Ditto, Muck, Jigglypuff, Coughing, Weepin' Bell, Victory Bell, Jinx, Articuno, Squirrel, Squirtle, Mankey, Goldeen, Geodude, Sandshrew, Sandslash, Graveler, Gyarados, Staryu, Starmie, Dratini, Dragonite, Mew. Let's talk a little bit about each course. The game has seven total courses that cover the entire island. Beach, Tunnel, Volcano, River, Cave, Valley, and Rainbow Cloud. Each of these courses offers a wide variety of secrets, hidden poses, and Pokemon to capture. 
beach puts you on the tracks that take you along the outskirts of the island. You constantly have a cliff to your left that makes you feel separated from the rest of the island, almost like a secluded beach in a way. The music is bubbly and reminiscent of what you would expect island music to be like. As the first step into the 3D Pokemon world, I feel like this did a great job with showing the player enough to keep them going, but without being overwhelming like some of the later courses can be. Tunnel is probably my least favorite of the courses we visit. It's just a series of big open rooms that doesn't have all that much going on. The slow start to the chorus carries throughout the rest of the level with a small variety of Pokemon. It does have an enjoyable secret though. If you take pictures of the Diglett, they eventually turn into Doug Trio. Then you can get a picture of the Middle Fingers Doug Trio. Best picture in the game by far. And the way you unlock Volcano from this course is a rather intuitive way that once again shows off the throw shit at everything to see what happens mechanic of the game. The music here is definitely the best part of the course for me. It fits the Pokemon dark, damp, electro factory feel. Volcano starts off with a burst of Pokemon coming at you. It's big and open and the landscape is fun to traverse. It's a drastic difference compared to Tunnel. It has a nice variety of Pokemon and some really fun secrets to explore. Charizard, being the fan favorite Pokemon, makes an appearance at the end from another one of the throw shit mechanics. The song starts off slow, but it quickly turns into an absolute banger. All in all, this course works very well with flow, even if you get caught on Vulpix or the Moltres Egg. The next course is River. This is another one I like a lot. Come to think of it, Tunnel is probably the only one I have any real issues with. So you float down a river and see some cool Pokemon. You can make some evolve, make some drown, or even make one zip zoom. But one Pokemon in this course almost makes it my favorite one. That being Metapod. So my favorite Pokemon is Caterpie. So it would be obvious why I would like a level with Metapod in it. Sure, that could be part of it. But my favorite part is that once Metapod drops, he won't lift up again until you hit it with another item. You could be stuck there for a thousand years and this guy wouldn't give a shit. It's just happy it found a friend. And I'm more than thrilled to spend eternity sitting right next to it. Yeah, so I love this course. I can't say it's my favorite, though. Oh, right. This course is one of the worst RNG Pokemon. Cloyster. Doesn't mean much for a normal playthrough, since you can go in and out of the courses as much as you want. Cave is another slow indoor course, but it has much more going on than Tunnel does. You start with twinkly subterranean feeling music that helps your journey throughout the cave. You have more evolutions and secrets that are pretty fun and hard to accomplish if you're a terrible shot like me. I don't have all that much to say about this one. It's enjoyable, with good music. Seems like the indoor courses are the least enjoyable of the seven courses. Both are slow, but at least Cave has a better setting and more things to discover. On to the final normal course, and quite frankly, the best one in the game. Valley. The song is an absolute fucking banger. Captures the Wild West feel while also keeping it up-tempo and bouncy. The perfect song. I could go on and on about this song, but I'll spare you that speech. So this course has a plethora of Pokemon and evolutions. You start with the Squirtle swimming that you can knock out of the water. All the Geodude and Graveler that you can knock off the walls to reveal Sand True or Sand Slash. A Magikarp you can evolve into a Gyarados. Star you that evolve into Star Me. This course has everything. It has fast parts, slow parts, technical parts. Everything you've been doing this whole game leads up to a single pester ball throw at the end to knock a manky off of a hilltop to unlock the finale of the game. Rainbow Cloud. This course is very simple and has a single Pokemon on it, Mew. You have to chuck pester balls at this ever-moving Pokemon to release him to take his photo. You're surrounded by a beautiful rendition of the intro song. All of the Pokemon signs as star constellations in the sky. Maybe a simple course, but sometimes the simplest things can bring out the beauty in a game. The game actually does have some post-game content in the way of the challenge score. It's a way to help you refine your skills for those Pokemon Snap stickers, or to show off to your friends the scores you achieved. Look, I love this game. I have so much nostalgia for it, it's insane. My original cartridge has a special place on my desk. It was even the first game I decided to speedrun. I know you saw high scores in the chapter title, but I won't be going over that too much. I was never a good shot in-game, so I never attempted high scores. So these are the high scores.
shout outs to all the high scorers out there for putting in the hard work to get these scores. That shit really isn't easy. Let's move on to something I could actually do. Speedrun. I wasn't very good. I think my top time was ranked in the top 15 at one point, but I never cared about my time. I just liked having fun with a game I loved and meeting great people. When I was a kid and in my teens, I would always pull this game out and see how fast I could beat it. Back then, my best time was probably about an hour and a half or so. By the time I started to use sites like Twitch, Speed Demos Archive, and Speedruns Live, I hadn't touched the game in years. But it was the first one to come to mind when I decided I wanted to be a speedrunner. My first full run shaved about an hour off of my previous hour and a half record from whatever years ago. You would think an on-rails shooter would make for a boring and simple speedrun, but I can attest to the fact that it is a very technical run with a nice learning curve as well as some RNG thrown in the mix, especially in 100%. So, the goal of speedrunning is to go fast, to beat the game in the quickest way possible. Snap runners achieve this by taking the most optimal and high scoring photos in the shortest possible time, also factoring in for lag reduction, minimizing menu times, and leaving levels as early as you can. I'll be showing clips of Gunlop's current any percent world record to showcase some of these strats. Since this isn't a tutorial by any means, I would highly recommend checking out Draghi or CC Neverender for all your strat and theory needs. I'll have the channels linked below. Timing starts upon hitting end on the name screen and ends when the red save text shows in the text box when Oak finishes talking to you after judging your Mew photo. The first big strat would be to take three normal photos of Pidgey, then turn right to get the optimal Pidgey photo. It's the first thing you do when you enter beach. It's part of the tutorial. The next strat would be to take a high scoring photo of Pikachu, which allows for us to skip the wait for the special tunnel Pikachu. So the special tunnel Pikachu takes time. You don't want to take time in speedruns. So to do this, you take a photo of Pikachu's tail as the center of the frame. It's a bit weird, but the Snap community devised a theory that states, taking a picture with a specific angle removes the distance between the camera and the Pokemon, which results in a higher size point score. Runners call this the square head theory. So basically, the square head theory is saying that because your head is square, shooting something at an angle will cause your head and camera to be closer to the Pokemon, resulting in a higher point score for the photo. For more information on this, I will have a document linked below. Most of the course afterwards is lag reduction, which is aiming the camera towards the sky or other uncluttered areas to get the highest frame rate possible, which means we'll be going through the level faster, taking quick shots to hit the points needed. Next course is Tunnel. Enter briefly and snap a photo of Electrode on your left and exit the course. This gets you the points needed to unlock apples, and then immediately go back into Tunnel. The strat here is hitting Electabuzz with the apple early on. This allows you to take a shot that gets more points than you would normally be able to get. Another strat in Tunnel is sacrificing points on Diglett to get a higher score on Dugtrio, which just means you take early photos of Diglett to better align yourself with Dugtrio without sacrificing the forward speed of the 0 1. Final strat of the course is a 3 in 1 combo, so you have to snipe apples from behind a wall to get one of the Magnemite to come closer to you while also getting the two farther Magnemite to combine. You get a picture of the special pose Magnemite that's closest to you, and then throw an apple to make it move back towards the other two so they join and become a Magneton. During this time, you're also throwing an apple at the Electrode to trigger the cutscene to unlock Volcano. So in between the Magnemite and Magneton photo, you're throwing that apple and hoping to get the final photo before the cutscene triggers. Usually you throw another apple at the Magneton so that it turns towards you and you can get a good photo of it. Other than that, it's mainly just lag reduction and quick snaps. Volcano has some early setups and management aspects for the runner to deal with. The first would be the Rapidash at the beginning. Runners look for a specific texture on the ground while timing an apple throw to create a quick and high scoring shot. The management part would come into play when taking the photos of Charmander and Magmar. The runner will be trying to manage the AI for both of these Pokemon. They're both in different locations, they both act independently, so you have to get them to come together. You throw apples to get them into position for both high scoring shots and the Magmar attack event. This event also allows the runner to get a good photo of Charmeleon, saving time and not needing to go to the end of the course for the Charmeleon there. The course finishes at about the halfway mark and coincidentally right after this setup. You throw an apple at the Moltres egg and then snap a very quick picture when it comes out and then you exit the course. It's very quick. River is a course that doesn't have a lot of stuff to talk about. Mostly just quick shots and lag reduction. 
One of the interesting strats though is getting a high scoring photo of Shelter and Slowbro. Starts with aiming up for lag reduction and using the th tree geometry above to know when to throw the apples. Throwing apples triggers Slowpoke to walk over to the bank that allows it to evolve. Luckily, Shelter is part of the evolution process, being the shell that bites the Slowpoke tail, making it easy to get a high scoring photo of Shelter and then quickly after getting a photo of Slowbro. They react with each other and you're going to be right there to take those pictures. You're going to get a high scoring points of both. Cave is a pretty busy course. Almost constantly moving around or setting up your aim for apples. The best strat in this course is Weep and Bell Snipe. Using the ceiling of the cave to line up your apple throws, you can hit Weep and Bell into the water much earlier and much farther than intended. Getting a quick picture of Weep and Bell before it falls in, then switching focus to Jigglypuff and Coughing, who are zooming right by your face while it transforms into Victory Bell. Quickly snapping a photo before early exiting the course. It's another course that you exit early. You exit every single course early, but this one is at about the halfway point when you exit. If you did everything correct throughout the run so far and got good RNG, then you can do a no pick valley. This suggests you would be taking zero pictures during valley, but in reality, you'll be taking a single picture upon course entrance. The Doug Trio sign. This is done because when you open the gate at the end of valley, Oak mentions the signs and how you should go take pictures of all of them. The remainder of the run is using the Zero Ones newly unlocked turbo function to take pictures of the signs as fast as possible and unlocking Rainbow Cloud. Rainbow Cloud isn't like the other stages. I did mention this earlier in the video. It's just Mew. Now, that doesn't mean it's an easy course. The Mew battle can lose a lot of time if the runner misses the pester ball shots. Missing a shot and letting Mew get past you forces another flyby segment. Each one of these misses wastes around 5 seconds. You miss two, there goes about 10 seconds in your run. That could be the difference between, you know, a PB and not a PB or world record and not world record, but chances are if you're on world record pace you're not going to miss it. The runners also have to deal with Mew going side to side. Uh, these are the ones that I always missed. I'm fucking terrible aim. Depending on how well your aim is, this is another possible section for time loss. Sometimes I lost like 10 seconds here from missing the shots. I probably should never speed around this game. Once the shield is down, you take a quick picture of Mew and quit the course because score doesn't matter at this point. So that finishes off the run and all the strats I personally wanted to talk about. Like I mentioned earlier, if you're interested in learning more about Pokemon Snap speedruns, routing, or theories, I would check out Draggy or CC Never Ender, both linked below. You could also check out the speedrun.com page for Pokemon Snap. I believe there is a link to the guides. Um, they might not be current though, I haven't checked in a while. The Discord should be linked there as well. That brings us to the end of this section and the end of the video. It's a short game, and I think it still holds up after 23 years. I mean, I constantly replay it. I don't even speedrun it anymore, but I play it probably once a month. It's, it's a quick, short game. It's cute. It's fun. Shoutouts to the Pokemon Snap speedrunners I've had the pleasure to chat with over the years. I'd like to give special shoutouts to CC Neverender, Quo, Candy, AJ, GameFanDan, and Draggy. Thank you all for watching and have a wonderful day.